Kia and welcome to the Niggly Niche Cast. This is your boy, the Niggly Dude, our Darkness Peptide Panther, here with the Wobbly Wild Card for another episode of the Niche Cast, serving up all that Kiwi sporting funk and a little bit of Kiwi music. A lot of Kiwi music, actually, that we will touch on in the opening stanza of this episode. You can support the Niche Cache and the Niche Cast directly on Patreon. Best way to support us, straight up the guts, and uh, we are building a two-lane highway, so you support us straight up the guts, and we come back in the other direction with a couple of bits and bobs that will be unleashed soon enough. We deliver a email newsletter on Mondays and Fridays, usually the Monday morning one, which is the time of recording this. I just dropped a whole lot of bits and pieces on Kiwi Sports, um, things like Jeden Patel, Matt Quinn and Hamish Rutherford playing county cricket in England while the Caribbean Premier League's going on, just more examples about why Kiwi Sport is the best, and yeah, we, we dish those out Mondays and Fridays, so a bit of extra information, and always we do plenty of writing about Kiwi Sports on the website blog thingy Majiggy. On the agenda this week, we've got a bit of a Kiwi music breakdown, touching on some fresh jams from the land of Aotearoa. We'll touch base with Lydia Ko. She just finished the tournament for this weekend. The White Ferns have named a squad to go to Australia and play three T20s and three ODIs all in Brisbane. So I'll drop a bit on that. We've got some Caribbean Premier League updates, and then we'll get into the big the big goody stuff, the NRL, another debut, a couple of different ideas floating around my noggin with regards to rugby league, and then the Flying Kiwis. Less about the on-field action without ballers, and more about signings. Plenty of flying kiwis signings which means that the flying kiwis are in travel mode they can't fly but they are flying kiwis but they're not flying at the moment they're kind of just using their uh two legs to get to a new club i guess i don't know i don't know what the fuck i'm talking about here wildcard kia ora talofa namaste to yourself yeah how we going i always um uh, it's normally me who gets tangled up in the in the overcomplicated metaphors. So nice way to start. Um, I, I mean, Libby Kikache would have had to catch a plane to get to Belgium, I assume. So I think that I think it holds up. I was just dealing in a bit of comedic writing there, Wildcat. I wasn't stuttering around anything. I was just being funny, you know. Yeah. Okay. It's improv comedy. But an improv comedy. So we'll. We will dive into these matters, and we will assess all of this, but there was a a minor moment that I thought would be a much bigger moment um, late last week that we can have a little discussion. Obviously, we don't want to go like, it gets a bit political, a bit crazy, and we're talking about the big US of A, so shit gets a bit weird, so we won't go too deep into this rabbit hole, but I do want to discuss this with you, Wildcard, because... I think we have the best example or the best situation, unfortunately or fortunately, of athlete power and athlete activism, um, obviously sparked by the NBA players deciding not to play a few games, which then filtered around to a lot of the other major leagues. In USA, women's NBA, um, MLS foot no, not MLS, uh, Major League Baseball, and a bit it of NHL MLS as well. Too. So it's I think for everyone around the world, it is a great opportunity to learn about player activism and how sports can intersect with political stuff at the moment. And it's been. It's been a weird one in my mind, Wildcard, because when this happened, I thought it was a major moment, and I thought that the NBA players had really, on the back of another shooting by the police to a to a black person, the players had really stepped into their power, and they'd actually taken serious action 
um, to lead a lot of communities in USA, I guess. So it's hard to word this, but yeah, I just thought it was a really powerful moment for them to take power into their own hands. And on the, like that stems from the fact that a lot of these leagues, NBA is predominantly African-American. Uh, NFL is high percentage African-American. Baseball and ice hockey, not so much. WNBA is also predominantly African-American. So like you've got this situation where a lot of the best athletes in the USA and the most powerful athletes in USA are African-American and yet there is this huge divide, racial divide and um, inequality in America between, well, it's just a country that's founded on a lot of slavery ideals. So I thought it was a really powerful moment. However, they, I, I won't say back down, but they came back around and they're going to continue playing NBA playoffs but they did manage to like raise awareness to a conversation about how little well just they they did manage to like Milwaukee Bucks got in contact with um, officials in the Milwaukee state area um, and different ideas had been implemented as they have been throughout the NBA bubble but perhaps the action on the court overshadowed it so in my own mind, I've kind of, I was a little bit disappointed that they didn't go all out, and I think that's what USA needs because what's like, it's literally a case of, unfortunately, at some point in the near future, remember there's a election in the USA coming up as well, so it's hostile at the moment. I imagine things are only going to get more and more hostile leading up to the election and around the election. Who's to say that another cop is not going to end the life of a innocent or semi-innocent like well regardless they don't need to be shot but something like this is going to happen again and what hap what's going to keep happening if this stuff keeps happening uh these professional athletes just going to keep boycotting single games and it was, it's just been a confusing journey in my mind to come to observing and learning about this and then you think like doing research around it how LeBron James got in contact with Barack Obama obviously like they're doing good things like LeBron James is doing great things with the voting stuff a lot of NBA players are doing great initiatives all of which centers around kind of to me it doesn't touch on the crux of the issues is, I guess what I'm trying to get at here wildcard there is systematic racism in the USA that is being played out day-to-day -day lives whether it is how the cops treat black people or just other instances. And I think the NBA players specifically are trying to have it a buck each way. They're trying to make substantial change. They're trying to tap into their full power as athletes, but they're also, I don't think they're going far enough. So it's like, but then again, I read about how LeBron James had contacted Barack Obama and they're doing serious consideration as to their best steps forward. So me, I'm a bit radical and I'm like, shut the shit down. You guys need to, and it's unfair on the players because, you know, I'm placing the burden all on the players and saying like the play, players need to grab this issue by, you know, the horns and really lead USA through it, which is unfair on the players. However, they are the most, pe like they are super duper powerful, but I don't know if they're really tapping into that power. It's very convoluted wildcard and in trying to assess like best courses of action in such a scenario i'm a bit all over the place and i would like to see a slightly more radical approach to get more drastic change because if predominant like if black athletes united and like you get you got guys like kyle corver jj reddick um you know alice crusoe there's a lot of white players in the nba who would follow suit like we're all holistic, lovely human beings, and a lot of the white athletes would join forces with the black athletes. But if you, like, the most powerful athletes in USA are African-American people, and if they took their power into their own hands and dictated certain events and certain leagues and how they operated, I think that would have the most drastic change. However, it seems to be a more of a 
delicate approach, I guess, wildcard. So how do you how do you see how things have unfolded and just learning from this so we can take some of these learnings forward to to more to situations that might appear closer to home in the future? Yeah, well, I mean, I'm also someone who's relatively radical in a lot of these kind of political ideas. I tend to be really fairly out there in a, in, in a lot of areas, but I, yeah, I have similar confusion to you because I, I just don't, oh man, it's, it's tricky to talk about because of it. it's, it's a very entangled kind of situation. And when we limit it specifically to police violence against African Americans, it's sort of, I think for some people that sort of limits their involvement and you can be like, um, it, it, like you like the example of other like non African American players in the NBA, of which there are quite a few, um, as many as there's been in quite a while, with a lot of international players there as well, and like you can be an ally and you can say the right things. And there was one of those messages from the big, um, the bigger protests earlier in the year around you know after George Floyd and all that, where it's like it's not enough just to not be a racist; you've got to be anti-racist, and you can you can like be about it you can say all the right things but it doesn't necessarily uh man it's like the the this, this has to get to a certain level for there to be actual actionable change so as much as like the 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 rhetoric and the messages got out there and it's been well received by a lot of people who were open to receiving it you know there's probably a lot of people as well whose perspectives and their mindset have been evolved by all this, and they've come to you know enlightenments about about the situation and how um, unforgivable and untenable it really is. And learning um, to find empathy for fellow human beings just because they may not look exactly like you or come from a slightly different background or whatever, realizing we all got more in common than we do our differences and all that kind of thing. Like a lot of I think also that like with big major news cycle type things around all this this will probably have uh repercussions through like down the years and into further generations and stuff like that where like you just shift the you shift the um uh what's what's the word like you just shift the bloody sliding scale type thing whatever they're called move it slightly to the side um of like this being a major uh problem in society that needs to be fixed and people are more um, amenable to that in the future for fixing it kind of thing. But that doesn't mean anything's happened in the immediate thing. And it is, it is. I can understand why the players, once another of these incidents um, came around, why there was such a negative sort of reaction and a lot of, um, not defeatism, but just players feeling like, oh, well, what did we actually accomplish through all this? And it's not that they didn't accomplish anything. It's just that um, there wasn't that immediate fix kind of thing because... The people who have the power to fix it and let's not pretend like that isn't a possibility they're always going to be like rogues in any society but what we're talking about here is like systemic problems that can be fixed through like political action and um you know legislature and and uh, the police union actually turning around and like giving a shit about this problem that would also help um in america like there are, there are things that can be done to stop this from happening anywhere near the frequency because you just have got to look around the world and see, like, this doesn't happen anywhere else. Well, those, like, the people who have the power to change those things aren't NBA players. Like, NBA players are doing all that they can do, and which is why, um, like, the prospect of, for example, I think when they said that the season might be, like, fully called off and all that, I think that was more only a bargaining tool to to ensure that like owners in particular i think owners probably bear a lot of the um responsibility for taking this to the next level um but that's a like that's a whole another um rabbit hole we don't need to get into immediately here but like the the players are doing what they can they're getting the message out they're being heard they're they're staying true to it as well they're not letting it disappear just because they're back playing basketball and it's worth remembering as well that their platform comes from playing basketball like if you stop playing basketball i think you lose that platform to some degree um not entirely but like the basketball has built you up to this point for for all these fellas um so i think also that's another reason why boycotting the entire season would have been a little bit um, 
sort of like uh self-defeating in a way but there yeah the the this is the main i think like what i'm coming around to now is probably the main frustration i've had with all this which is why are the nba players having to lead the fight like they they absolutely like this community is going to be a part of it but right now it just feels like nba players are running the show and um I know there's a lot of protests still going on around America on the ground with, um, you know, activists who have, you know, made made this their their life currently to to fight these things, and those are all like righteous people doing righteous things and all that. But um, the main focus of it all right now is NBA boycotts, and that's good. Like it keeps it in the it keeps it in the um, in the in the news cycles and all that, and in the wider public psyches, but. And I just, with all of these things, it's like, if if the other side of it who aren't, for whatever reason, budging, if they can just sit and wait it out, which is kind of what has been happening, and it's kind of what always happens with these things, you just sit back and wait it out, then, like, you, you, you're not really achieving anything, which is, which is that same frustration that you started with. It's like, how do you actually get it to the next level and get stuff done? And that's that's my frustration, is it seems like there's this enormous responsibility to the point of a burden that these players are obviously feeling to the point where once another setback happened, like um, they didn't feel like they were in the right headspace to be able to play basketball. And the, the Milwaukee Bucks leading the way, Milwaukee obviously, um, the Jacob Blake was shot in was shot seven times in the back um in wisconsin which is you know milky bucks the closest closest team um this is their home state the closest team to where that happens like um obviously they would feel it a little more um intensely but it's just it just seems like a lot of players were quite like despondent after all that and it just shows like the the amount of emotional pressure they're taking on themselves in the middle of their playoffs by the way like the peak of their season to to feel like to to fight this whole thing and it just feels like somewhere along the line and it's not downwards it's certainly up the scale where this is happening those players are being let down to the point where this burden is falling on them because someone else has got to be taking that baton and running with it too it's like other other aspects of that american society need to be stepping up and actually doing something and listening to um listening to what's probably a majority of people who say this isn't right and this shouldn't happen um whether they agree with all aspects i mean it's very difficult in america because the problem is everything's so like cut in half where 50 percent of the country is going to be absolutely on board 50 percent just won't listen to anything the other side says and then the other side won't listen to anything they say and it's just been so segmented like that and in an election year this isn't a coincidence this is happening now as well in an election year i don't think it's it's frustrating because there's people who um who could be putting their own neck on the line um specifically within american local body politics who could be putting their own neck on the line a lot more than they are um and they're just not and leaving this to like i just don't know how we get to the point where nba players are are um are just running the show like this like how is nba players supposed to be out there in front like uh, running the point to use a, an accurate um, metaphor, like, it just it just astounds me how this is where that society is at. But I mean, you you can't, yeah. I, I'm I'm all for I'm all for the action. I'm all for staying about it. It's just that someone else has got to step up somewhere along the way. It's quite easy to see why the NBA players are in this position because culturally they have the most power. Like. The NBA is the biggest sports league in the world. Sports and music runs the world. And now we're seeing that intersection. Now we're seeing the people who have the biggest platforms. It's their responsibility. So, yes, it's kind of unfair on NBA players to place that burden on them. But you, like, there's nowhere else, like, there's no other pockets that have the leverage that they have. And that's just how the world is in, in 2020. And if I'm a player, I want to, like, I understand the argument that you want to, you're in the NBA, you're playing basketball, and you have your platform through NBA by playing basketball. But if I'm a player right now, I want to be in my community. If I'm one of these players, like, whether it's Jalen Brown, LeBron James, these players who have played a prominent role already, I want to be in my community. 
I want to be leading my community. I want to be hand to hand, face to face, feet on the ground. And I just feel like right now in the NBA bubble, a lot of it is surface area because I told you on a previous podcast, having things painted on the court, wearing shirts and wearing names and saying stuff over a press conference, that's not that's not change because basketball fans are just tuning out of that. They're watching the basketball and the people you're trying to change their minds, they're not going to listen. So it's all superficial when it's like in the bubble and that's just where I get a bit weird. And the last thing I'd say before we move on to some better... It's an echo chamber at this point, isn't it? Yeah, and then who benefits from the NBA bubble happening? The players get to play basketball, the players get to make a bit of... Well, the players get to make somewhat close to their regular salary. But the people who benefit from the bubble happening... Is the NBA, it's the owners, it's Disney. Who and those are probably white people. Majority white people running the NBA, majority white people owning NBA teams. Disney ownership's pr- predominantly gonna be white. That's why the NBA bubble's happening. Because there's contractual obligations, there's money that needs to be made. And that's where I get a bit weird because yeah, you can be desperate to keep the NBA going. We want to keep the NBA going. Well, who benefits from it? It's just it, it's the cycle of the USA is just in motion here. You've got a predominantly black playing group who are going through pretty much their kind of version of hell where they're trying to play basketball and they've got their country um, tapping into its deep roots of racism right now. And who are the people that benefit most from the NBA playoffs happening in this current state? I'd suggest it's mainly white people. So it gets a bit like, I just don't know. I don't know. We just got to wait and see what happens. And I'm like how I told you when the bubble started and we're reflecting on the bubble and stuff like that. I don't think we've seen or heard anything close to the last of us. Like, When the bubble started, it was like, okay, all this stuff's happening, but I think another event's going to happen, and that's going to stir shit up. And that happened, and we are nowhere near to a point where anyone can say, oh, everything's fine. So something else is going to come up, and it's going to be heavy, and it's going to be terrible in the USA, because that's just the state of their country. And, yeah, I don't know how much has been achieved over the past five to six days we'll get into some kiwi tunes here wildcat i have been pumping there's a fresh release from diggy dupe he is a auckland mc but a hip-hop from gray lynn and he's got a new project that's me that's team first listen this morning and it was wavy as fuck this is uh, pretty mellow tunes, varied flows, very rhyme patterns. Uh, very different to a lot of the other like young hip-hop that is out there in the world today. You've got this kind of whole trap buzz in Australia you've um, and elsewhere in the world, but that's kind of the music that's taken off out of Australia. And then you look over to Aotearoa hip-hop, and it's very different, very unique, and that's what we do best. Um, so shout out Dig Dupe, that's me, that's team. Go listen to that one because it's very good. And Diggy Dupe always has a different perspective. He has his own style. And it's it's quite, uh, there's soul to it. That's that's probably the best summation is that there's soul to Diggy Dupe's music that you can actually feel um, as well as like just head bobbing beats and different rhyme patterns and different stuff like that. Um, bit of a Aotearoa hip hop who's who on the feature list as well. You've got uh, Swidder is on a track. Rizvan is a local MC from Auckland as well. You've got AP from Church and AP. Church and AP dropped a couple of fresh tracks um, over the past week as well. So check out Church and AP. Um, you got Diggy Dupe, and there is. Old uh, Dallas Tamara, 
he's the lead singer from Fat Freddy's Drop. He's been busy um, making a bit of music as well. So his he released a video for a song, No Flowers. And he's also got a couple of videos on his YouTube channel for just different lockdown jams, as he calls it. So check those out. Um, and for a super duper deep cut, jump on Bandcamp or just search up Christoph L. Truento. He's got some fresh um, Kiwi dub as well. I think I think Roots dub is like the quintessential New Zealand music. So always happy when you get a bit of that. And along that line, you've also got the Midnight Riders and the Naram rhythm section that I mentioned last week to check out. Um, I believe the best have a new album as well. Jump Rope Gazes. Is that correct, Wildcard? That's the one that came out, um, I think, in July. So it's been out for like a month and a half or something at this point. Um, you know, good tunes. It was in either the last um, album, Jukebox, or the one before that. So, yeah, for sure. Been all over that one. What else has been on your uh, imaginary radio? Yeah, well, while we're talking about um, Kiwi Tunes here, there is an album coming out, uh, not this Friday, but the Friday afterwards, I believe it is. Um, new one from Troy Kingy, who is uh, based up in Kiri Kiri. Um, so a little bit of Northland Solidarity there. The, the album is called The Ghost of Freddy Cesar. Um, looking at the old, uh, what you call it here. Um, it is billed on his band camp, at least, as... Um, somewhere here, a funk album reimagining the music of the legendary American artist, Freddy Cesar. So, um, yeah, by the, the, there's one song that's come out from it so far, one single released ahead of time, which was kind of a sort of, is the album closer as well, so it's a bit of a sort of smooth, more uh, emotionally resonant one. Um, but it sounds like this album's going to be pretty heavy on the funk, sort of like of a of a sort of uh, Curtis Mayfield kind of 1970s, um, Isaac Hayes kind of uh, kind of vibe that kind of um, influence and the the reason that's well first of all the reason that's interesting is because Troy King is great makes great music and that sounds like it's going to be a fantastic album. Second reason is because all of his albums are real high concept and it's um, it's always a, a fascinating one to see where he goes because it's not just a bunch of songs. It's also like like the impression you get from that is it's going to be another one of those where there's like a un uniting theme and very like um, conceptual and how he does it. And it's the fourth album he's released in four years. And this fits into this kind of fascinating thing that he's doing, which like not kind of fascinating, absolutely, completely, 100% fascinating, which I'm kind of like, it's so ambitious and it's so bloody like, awesome to see that kind like this kind of thinking but he's he's got this project where he calls it um 10 10 10 so he's doing 10 albums in 10 years with 10 different genres so each album sort of touches on a different sound um this will be the fourth one his first was 2016 he did um guitar party at uncle's batch which was more of a like um jammy kind of bluesy kind of influence to it uh very like um, I guess I don't want to say Jimi Hendrix because that's a bit outrageous to compare anyone to Jimi Hendrix, but it kind of had that kind of, um, at least that kind of creative vibe to it. Um, then he follows that up with uh, Shake That Skinny Ass All The Way To Zygotron, which is, as you get from the, from the thing, a kind of um, space funk type record, very sci-fi, very like quite psychedelic in a lot of places. Um, last year he did Holy Colony Burning Acres, which was more in that sort of reggae and dub kind of sound and very much focusing on um, worldwide uh, indigenous rights and things like that. Another great album. So he's three for three so far. So the fourth one's going to be um, equally outstanding, I'm sure. And it's the fourth out of ten, so I don't even know where he's going to go from this. Like <laughs> the There are a lot of different genres out there. There's a lot of different kind of like ways in which you could do it. I don't know... Um, what direction you'll go after this but it's kind of amazing to see um just like just that level of ambition and that level of keenness to do something like to take on a project like that is it's amazing and so far the results have also been amazing so i'm pretty hyped up for that one coming out um the for the uh yeah the freddie cesar album coming out in a week and a half a little bit more than that 
Um, I'm assuming Freddy Cesar is a completely fictional character because I've never heard of him as well, but that's just all part of the part of the myth. Beautiful there, wild card. We'll do a quick little wrap up of some newsy stuff. I think, I think the Arkansas Championship is all finished. I don't. They've finished three rounds, so I just don't. I was trying to find if it's a three rounder or a four banger because sometimes they do flip those things around on the LPGA Tour. Um, regardless, at the time of recording that, Lydia Ko is tied for twenty eighth. So she doesn't look like she's going to uh, continue her streak of top 20 finishes, but she is still among the best. So that's pretty much since the restart, she's been she's had finishes in the top 30 for every single tournament. So um, that's pretty good for Lydia Ko in 2020. We also had this White Fern squad, which is as per most white fern squads amy satterthwaite does come back though she is set to play her first odi since march 2019 and her first t20 since february 2019 she's back for the white ferns to give the white ferns a batting lineup of amy satterthwaite susie bates and sophie divine which is awesome you also have jess watkin returning um, she played a few games, I think, in 2018. But the big in, selection-wise, is Wellington's Deanna Doughty, who, this is an example of the cricketing depth for the White Ferns because there's no Lee Kasprick, who's, who is a off-spinner, and there's no Anna Pedersen, who I think is also an off-spinner. So two spinners who are usually in most White Ferns squads, they're not in this squad, and the White Ferns call up Deanna Doughty, who is from Wellington. And she has, in 2017, she was fourth in wickets for the 2017 Super Smash. In 2018 Super Smash, she was second in wickets. In the 2019 Super Smash, she was third in wickets. She, I think in 2018 and in 2019, she was behind Amelia Kerr, who also plays for Wellington and is also a leg spinner. So you've got talented spinners kind of throughout Aotearoa, especially considering the White Ferns development contract list included off the top of my head, Fran Jonas and Eden Carson. Fran Jonas is from Auckland. She's like 16 or 17 years old. Eden Carson is from Otago. She's also a teenager, I think, 18, 19. Um, they're in the development list, and then you have Deanna Doughty coming into the White Fern squad for the first time, and she's been in the top five for Super Smash wick wickets for each of the past three seasons with her leggies, and the only spinner who's been better is Amelia Kerr. So that puts into perspective what Deanna Doughty has been doing for the um, Wellington Blaze. Deanna Doughty also has a T20 career average of 17.22. So she's pretty damn good at bowling leg spin in domestic cricket in Aotearoa. Keep in mind, the one thing that has been annoying about White Ferns cricket over the past 18, 24 months has been the inability of young players to step up pretty much other than Amelia Kerr. Um, Young players stepping up from domestic cricket to international cricket, there's been a hefty um, void in which those young domestic players can't carry on, can't develop quickly enough to international cricket, um, which to me I interpret that as being there, there being a big gap between women's domestic cricket in New Zealand and international cricket, all of which um, just you got to, you can't expect the under Dowdy to come in and blow the white fins or Australia away, like there's a big gap between domestic cricket and international cricket, but Deanna Dowdy's been doing it consistently for a number of years, so shout out to her. Um, that series is to be played strictly in Brisbane, and I think it is mid-September. T20 start 26th of September, so we'll keep an eye on that. Yes, uh, have you caught much of the Caribbean Premier League there, Wildcard? No, not a lot. I can't say I have. Um, I've 
got little bits and pieces um, here and there, and I mean, I've been missing Kiwi cricket a lot. I've been having Black Caps withdrawals and um, having a White Fern series coming up is is a very, very tasty prospect considering that. I'm still waiting for some any kind of news about where the Black Caps are, what they're doing next, but... Um, I was hoping some of that Caribbean stuff could be a nice little sell for that, but um, I also just don't have a lot of time for um to, for uh what do you call it franchise twenty twenty cricket. It's not as exciting to me as the old uh, uh the test matches and stuff that are going on in England, for example. But um, if I happen to turn it on the telly and I can catch a Kiwi at bat or something or with the ball at that time, I'll sit through and watch it. But I haven't been so lucky generally. Um, I keep Absolutely, like stumbling on players I've never heard of and not being particularly interested. So, uh, sad one for me. But um, how the fell is going? What have I been missing? We Scott Kugeline still trucking along all right. He is second in wickets overall, which is handy. However, didn't take a wicket in his last game, and he's taken one wicket in his last three games. So he's hit a bit of a plateau. I did mention Mujib Ur Rahman, who is the Afghani spinner. He's now leading all wicket takers. He is first, and that's bloody good effort for him. In fact, there's two Afghani spinners. Muhammad Nabi is fourth. He's much more of a veteran, um, and he is fourth in wickets. Just on that young Minnow Nation spinner, discussion idea thingy magic that i brought up last week um lamachane the nepalese spinner he's got an average of 12.88 with nine wickets majib ur rahman 13 wickets at average is 7.15 so um yeah those dudes are going all right those dudes are going all right as far as spin in the cpl goes kugeline is second we got to go down to mitch santner he is 18th He's got five wickets at 15, which is a good effort fold. Santner, other than that, it's uh, slim pickings. we still got a lot of, not a lot of, but we got some weird shit happening. East Shodi missed a couple of games. He's got two wickets at 68. Um, and old Corey Anderson, the big time slugger, he has 53 runs at an average, a batting average of 7.57 and a strike rate of 86.88 now when i'm looking at t20 numbers averages aren't so important so for like tim seifert's got a he's got 60 runs at an average of 30 i'm not going to pay attention to the 60 runs or 30 i'm going to pay attention to the strike rate and he's doing a good job with a strike rate of 100 down the order for trinbago if you if you're not scoring that many runs, even Mitch Santner, Mitch Santner's got 56 runs, average of 56. So again, don't pay attention to the average, but pay attention to the strike rate, strike rate of 109. So for Santner and Tim Seifert, yeah, sure, we'd love to for them to have strike rates of 130, 40, 50, whatever it is. But in just doing your job for your team, you at least want a strike rate of 100 if you're not scoring too many runs. Compare that to Corey Anderson, he's got a strike rate of 86.88. So not only is Corey Anderson struggling for runs, he's struggling to score effectively. Like he's, he's struggling to do 2020 batting, to be honest. So there is some weirdness in this uh, CPL. The weirdness continues. Colin Munro slipped down the rankings a bit. He is now 13th and... He hit a 49 not out, then he hit a 50. That's That was really good for old Manru. And then he hit a 17, and then he's gone back to back with the old Quackers. So, not a good weekend for Munro. Ross Taylor's still doing all right. He's trucking along. He is 11th in runs, but big dog, Lenny Phillips, veteran of the CPL, leading all run scorers. Um, top of the top of the charts, 207 runs, average of 41, decent strike rate though of 127.77. So, Glenn Phillips and Scott Kugeline are still the big doggies of the CPL. Kugeline has hit a hit a minor plateau, 
and I won't claim it, but I did kind of allude to the fact that batsmen might become more familiar with him and he might struggle in the second half of the CPL. Um, so interesting to see what happens there. Glenn Phillips continuing to be kind of just one of the best batsmen no one talks about. So from Aotearoa. So shout out Glenn Phillips. He's been a top five run scorer in the CPL for the last few years. Casually made his test debut last summer as well. He's an all-format slinger. Yeah, Glenn Phillips just feels like one of those dudes who, like, he's been a little, like, I remember when he came in and played some, um, I think it was, I think it was ODI cricket, I don't think it was 2020 cricket, he first came in and played a couple games and didn't do anything, and it was kind of like, I mean, he's come in and played that test match, and obviously was only filling in at that point like he feels like a dude who when he gets a consistent run you're not going to be you like in any of the three formats if not all three formats you're not going to be able to get him out of that black caps team it's just a matter of time until like a pretty settled black caps lineup as it is um until that opportunity just arises like he's just kind of biding his time eh, and waiting for that one to happen um it's, it will happen as well. He's, he's still a young batsman, so it'll get there and he'll score a lot of international runs. I'm pretty confident in saying that. And the thing, when you watch Glenn Phillips bat, like you're watching someone hit boundaries that other batsmen can't. Like You've seen it on the um, the New Zealand cricket scorecards as well. Like Just watching Glenn Phillips hit boundaries in domestic cricket very few batsmen can hit the areas that he can or hit the boundaries how he does because he it's it's a bit Peter Ingram-y ish which is super rough on Glenn Phillips like shout out Glenn Phillips you're not similar to Peter Ingram but just the maybe a lack of <laughs> oh, <with> better footwork <laughs> a lack of footwork from Glenn Phillips however Peter Ingram, notorious opening Black Caps batsman of yesteryear, who earned his way to the Black Caps like a couple of games, I think ODI Black Caps, and just played international cricket with his feet in a couple of bags of concrete. It was a bit weird. And it was uh, a weird time for Kiwi cricket, just to come to think of it, wildcard, the absolute battlers who uh, earned black caps debuts but that's the whole shtick of kiwi sport like we've talked a lot about like the the halfback the halves who have played for the kiwis over the past 15 years 20 years some very strange kiwis halves like international rugby league halves some of the maybe selections for the All Whites, like just weird battler players who earned a, a debut, maybe because the depth wasn't there. Absolutely. So, shout out to Ping Peter Ingram. Or because Anthony Hudson was a bit of a weirdo. Yeah, I think it was a bit more prior to the Anthony Hudson era when we're in the crux of the um, New Zealand still really good at sport era, but just lacking a bit of depth to hit that next level. 2020, where We've well and truly got the depth to um, make some waves. And I think I was trying to make a point there that Glenn Phillips it is a bit similar to Ingram just with his lack of footwork, but his hand-eye coordination, his power, he's an absolute monster athlete, as I've discussed a few times over the past 12 months. And he, no matter where he stands in the crease, no matter where his foot, like what his footwork is doing, he can still hit the ball to an odd boundary. Usually, though, just come just speaking off the top of my head here, like usually when I'm rolling through my memory bank of Glenn Phillips' boundaries, he's hitting with the flow of the delivery, kind of like so. No matter where he stands in the crease, if you bowl outside off, the boundary is going to be scored on the offside. He's not going to hoik it over to mid wicket and if you bowl on leg stump he's not going to try and like squeeze that over third man no he's just going to flick it to find leg for six like it's very thinking about it a bit more like it's very simple and effective with how he bats i 
I think of batsmen. Oh, uh, the first thought I had in my mind was Ross Taylor doing his uh, slog sweep over Cal Corner, and it's a beautiful thing. And I think for Kiwi cricket fans, we all connect with it because it's a shot we can all play. However, that is a bit forceful. Like you're hitting a ball outside off over Cal Corner. With Glenn Phillips, I believe he just it's 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 far more flowy. So if you give him a length ball on off stump, it's gonna go uh, long off or cover. If you go wide outside off stump, it's gonna go third man. If you bowl on the leg stump, full, it's gonna go fine leg. If you bowl short, leg stump. It's going to go over square leg. Like everything just seems more natural and at ease with Glenn Phillips. Um, and maybe that's something to keep an eye on as we move forward. And do you have any memories of how Glenn Phillips batted in that test match wildcard? Um, test match against yeah, Australia. Yeah, um, plenty of injuries happening. Was a bit strange. He got the call up last minute. Comes in half century on debut. Any ideas about that? Yeah, I remember, I think... I'm pretty sure there was a decision he got away with early on where he could have been out nice and cheap like um and I think there was I I don't remember him being particularly free flowing on that day. I think he probably had to grind it out a lot which was kind of um the it, it was what was required on that day as well because there was this test series where the black cats were just getting pummeled. Um I I have a lot of memories from when I watched him score 100 against England for New Zealand A as well though where he like didn't hit an overly large amount of boundaries there either. He was very good at just like working the field around, um, which shows you like the the levels to his game, which is pretty handy to have out there. Um, put the bad ball away, but when there wasn't a bad ball, and this was against an English test lineup as well, albeit in a warm up situation, so not at full like capacity, but still like he he dealt with everything he worked the ball around nicely he got his ones and twos um didn't get bogged down if the boundary ball wasn't there sort of thing and um real bloody impressive innings and then like from his test match if yeah that's my that's the memory i have of that test 50 was him having to really work for his runs and nothing came easy and but just like sort of grinding it out which is another level to his game as well eh? and i think the the point's been made quite a few times like when you watch him bat these days um i remember when he was coming up and sort of the auckland scene people talked about him like he was a bit of a brendan mccullum back when he was more of a wicket keeper in those days as well but just that hand-eye coordination which is um the the overwhelming strength of mccullum's game is just how like how quickly he could like play any one of his shots which allowed him to be so aggressive as well but um i think when you see him now it's more of a Steve Smith thing. And, you know, people have pointed this out. I'm pretty sure they pointed this out when he played um, his, you know, the Fox Sport crew when he played his test match there. Is like, he's got that fidgety thing about him, but he also has that Steve Smithy way of being able to, like, just... I think Steve Smith is another player who plays in the flow, like you were saying, very, like, as well as anyone who's just, like, because he can access so many areas of the ground. With Smith, it comes from quite a outrageous technique, but it works so well for him. He can hit the ball behind square whenever he wants, and he can always get that single. And it just allows him to like, to, to let the game come to him in a way. And I think there's a, I think there's a bit of that about the way Glenn Phillips plays as well. Obviously quite a few steps down the rung and he's still got a long way to go to establish himself anywhere near that level. But, um, you know, signs of what we've seen so far are pretty cool. I'm all here for a little, uh, Glenn Phillips tangent. The, the Steve Smith comparison does feel very apt because <laughs> I think, like, yeah, you need good footwork and balance, I think. So it's maybe less about the footwork, more about the balance and your hands. So your balance comes from your head being still and having a good base. And then you want your hands as... I think you want to imagine like a tire that's wrapped around your your body and you want your hands to stay inside that that tire space you don't want your hands far away far away from your body if you have good footwork then you can probably get away with flashing around with your hands 
But if you're not going to move your feet as much, you can still be really effective, I reckon, if you have really good balance and you keep your hands tight. And so it's just, that's where your power comes from. Keeping your hands tight means uh, you can manipulate the ball as well. You can play a lot later. And I think the yeah the comparison of Steve Smith with Glenn Phillips is really, really good there. Only 23 years old. Holy shit. Glenn Phillips is only 23 years old. He has a first class average as a 23 year old of 39, which is really impressive for a young lad. We, a lot of what we're saying, uh, his test, he scored 52 runs in that test against Australia and his strike rate from that test as a whole was 43, which is well below his first class strike rate of 60. So definitely played a test match innings, which is good because a lot of what we're describing with Glenn Phillips not conducive to success at the test match level. But I, I had an idea there, Wildcard. You're not so keen on Tom Blundell opening the innings in test match cricket. And he is someone who doesn't fulfill, like even me, or the just the, he doesn't fulfill the viewer, I don't think, with super duper confidence that he's a really long term test match opener because. Some of the footwork is a bit lacking. So it'll be interesting just to see how these batsmen progress over the next over the summer. Um, whereas you look at someone like Devin Conway or Will Young, who are the other batsmen kind of on the fringes of the test team, very textbook kind of batsmen. A batsmen who all their basics are, re are good, and then they have their little bit of their own pizzazz. Like Devin Conway, his work through point is really high class. And they add their own little bit of spice. And then you've got slightly off-kilter techniques of Tom Blundell and Glenn Phillips coming in as well. So just stuff to keep an eye on as we move towards the Kiwi cricketing summer. However, Glenn Phillips is still out here dominating the Caribbean Premier League. And to be honest, Wildcard, he's the only Kiwi batsman who has dominated the Premier, uh, Caribbean Premier League for three straight seasons. So, big it up to G. Phillips. Rippin' Jamaica. Shout out Jamaica. Wouldn't mind a little trip around the uh, the West Indies following a bit of cricket there, Wildcard. Make a move to Barbados, a little bit of St. Lucia, then hit the, the South American continent and go to Guyana and visit a couple of Trinidad and Tobago islands and whatnot. It'll be, uh, yeah, a bit of fun when fans are allowed back into watching stuff. We had another NRL debut wildcard last night, Sunday night. Matthew Tomoko made his debut for the Canberra Raiders. He played 35 minutes and he's been a centre... Since moving to the Raiders, he was part of their Jersey Flag Under-20s championship team, I think, last year. And he was initially named in the Junior Kiwis Under-19 squad, which was a super weird fixture. Mainly because it was on the same weekend as the Jersey Flag Under-20s Grand Final, so someone like Tomoko couldn't play. Um... So he was a right center for the Raiders jersey flag team last year, I think. And he was on, named on the bench, which had me intrigued. Like, how's he going to be used? Is he actually going to play? Because quite often, carry an outside back on the bench just, just in case. And he ended up coming on for Curtis Scott. I think Curtis Scott suffered an injury. And then Tomoko came on right center. Did a fair job. Not big stats. Because... The Raiders were just steamrolling through the Bronco uh, Bulldogs elsewhere. Um, Tomoko, as a player, not overly big, but he is very agile, nimble on his feet, and very powerful for someone who doesn't look as powerful as he is. Very, very powerful. 
And as as far as like uh, getting into a bit of the history goes, he went to Auckland Grammar School and he was a gun for the Grammar First 15 in the midfield. But while he was at Auckland Grammar, he also made a lot of the New Zealand Rugby League rep teams. Um, so like 2016, he was at the New Zealand Under-16 NZRL National Performance Camp, which, hey, he won an award as well. He won an award for courage. So shout out Matthew Tomoko, the Courage Values Award winner in 2016 for New Zealand Rugby League. Uh, he made New Zealand under 16s in 2000, 2016, alongside Stafford Toa, alongside Jordan Rickey, playing with the Broncos, Asu Kepa'oas with the West Tigers. So he pretty much played New Zealand age group representative footy while he was at Auckland Grammar, while he was playing first 15 rugby for Grammar, which is just another example of first 15 schools in New Zealand, primarily the big first 15 schools in New Zealand, they only care about talent. They only care about who the best talent is, and a lot of the best talent is playing junior rugby league in Auckland, and that's where they get their talent from. They're not necessarily looking for the, as a pipeline to New Zealand rugby. They're just out for the best talent, and that's fine, but people need to be aware that like, the New Zealand Warriors have multiple players playing King's College First 15. New Zealand Warriors have Jeremiah Asi, who's playing First 15 for St. Peter's. Um, they got, I think, Cassius Cowley's from Rotorua. He's playing for Mount Albert Grammar First 15. I think there's another one playing for Grammar, um, but they do have... Ali Liatawa, he's playing for King's College First 15. They also have Francis Manulelawa, who I might have talked about a bit on this podcast. He is in the midfield for King's College First 15 and didn't play SG Ball because he's too young. He's still under 16s and I think he's year 11, maybe year 12, playing for King's College First 15 and is like renowned as one of the best First 15 players in Aotearoa. Um, so that's just further information about the, oh, I don't know if it's a balance or a tension or what it is, but people need to know that a lot of the best rugby league talent in New Zealand and in Australian NRL clubs comes from First 15 Rugby because those First 15 Rugby schools recruit from Rugby League. Um, however, someone like Matthew Tomoko, I did find this wild card. <sighs> I don't know the exact year, but he was in the same Bill McLaren rugby union team, which is a, there are rugby union tournaments in Auckland, such as Roller Mills, Bill McLaren, and he was in the same Auckland East team, I think it was intermediate age, he was in the same team as Stafford Toa and Stephen Masters, um, way back in the day, and since then... Stafford Toa and Matthew Tomoko have been like pretty much joined at the hip in a lot of these rep teams. And yeah, Matthew Tomoko then went on to like New Zealand NZRL under 18s. Played in the team that I always refer to, the New Zealand under 18s team from 2017, which now has. Uh, Hayes Perham, Mawane Hiroti, Matthew Tomoko, Jackson Paulo, Paul Turner, Jordan Rickey, and Stephen Masters and Peter Holler. They've all played NRL footy. And that game, they played against Tana Boyd. They also played against Sean Bloor, who's with the Tigers, David Fafita, Spencer Lenny, who's with the Penrith Panthers. So that was a pretty epic uh, game of footy, that one. And yeah. Matthew Tomoko. So he's from, he's a Mount Wellington Warriors slash Ellerslie Eagles Jr. Went to Auckland Grammar first 15. And then while at Grammar, he made all the New Zealand Rugby League age group rep teams. And then he's off to the Raiders. 
won a Jersey Flag Under 20s Championship with the Raiders last year. NRL debut right centre this year. And he is the 12th Kiwi NRL debutant of 2020. The epic year of Kiwi Rugby League debuts continues. And I think we're going to get a few more. I think there's a few more debuts in store as well. Um, Jira Momosia might get a debut with the Knights. That's the one I'm looking out for. Darius Farmer is a... He was also on that New Zealand under-18s team from 2017. He was named on the extended bench for the Gold Coast Titans this week. He's an edge forward who's battled... I think he had testicular cancer. Um, So he's nearing a debut as well so there's plenty of uh there's a couple of debuts to watch out for moving forward also so with all that like first 15 stuff so you've got like players who are playing um like league growing up and then they play first 15 and then they go off to league clubs and you got league clubs signing players out of first 15 and you got people who are playing probably first 15 and first 13 like both of them at like simultaneously for the same school i would imagine in some cases and or like one for school one for club kind of thing is it just one of those things like because if you're a 15 or 16 year old like just prime athlete um playing first 15 for a pretty like high profile school and you get like a couple offers in from professional clubs thinking down the line like you'd basically just take the better offer wouldn't you so you kind of is it just a case of you just gotta be like ready to go either way like rugby or rugby union and then i guess there's also the situation where i guess i would imagine nrl teams are recruiting at a younger age than rugby union teams because of the pathways because of the way super rugby works and it's not necessarily connected with um with uh, whatever the hell they're calling the NPC these days, all that in terms of like players come up, play for their local province, then get signed for their local um, or whatever the lo- closest is for Super Rugby team. I would imagine, whereas you compare that to like NRL teams who have academy systems and and whatnot, I'd imagine the NRL teams probably get in there first as well. But I mean, that just seems like such a not a weird situation because it makes sense when you think about all the things but i I would imagine is that right like you kind of just got to be ready to go either way depending on which scout you happen to impress on the right day as a as a young player is that kind of the way it goes yes and i would add that if you are a rugby league player you can probably relax that a rugby union super rugby team isn't going to come scout you. That's the only caveat. Like that, If you're in that position where you're entrenched in league and you haven't really done any rugby union, you don't need to stress about super rugby coming to you. That's not happening But because there is more than enough rugby depth. And if anything, the major point here is that New Zealand has excessive talent. Like, even a lot of these rugby union guys who play like uh, one season of NPC or two seasons of Super Rugby, then they go to Europe. So you've got those bracket guys, you've got the All Blacks, you've got the guys in Super Rugby right now. There's just so much talent in either code um, that I have to highlight that point first and foremost. Like This is a celebration of New Zealand as a sporting nation and a... Um, rugby league and rugby union nation as well as the fact that a lot of these kids just grow up with a rugby ball and it's not necessarily a rugby league ball or a rugby union ball it's just a rugby ball and you know how to you just throw the rugby ball around like it's not necessarily where like they the kids might be in their backyard and one dude's trying to be Sonny Bill the other dude's trying to be Bowden Barrett or one dude's trying to be Sean Johnson the other dude's trying to be Artie Savia like those lines are just so blurred um, in young footy players in Aotearoa. So that's always a key point. The intricacies of the pipelines are very interesting. Like I could go on for hours and um, it's something that I've learned a lot about over the years writing about rugby league. The general shtick is to, like a lot of the... I think a lot of the big first 15 schools 
they recruit from uh, age group rugby league tournaments or because I've got a team here so in 2016 Atene Nanai Satoru was playing rugby league for counties Manukau in a under 17s tournament and he was playing in the same team as Caleb Milne so both Nanai Satoru and Caleb Milne played first 15 rugby for St. Kent's. Caleb Milne was then signed by the Melbourne Storm. I think he's with the Cronulla Sharks now. And Nan- Nanai Satoru then went on to um, ditch rugby league and he went to play sevens, which is fine. Like That's a good career pathway. And for someone like Tini Nanai Satoru, he was far closer to immediately moving to professional rugby. So that's a better option for him, perhaps, than sticking with rugby league because a lot of the first 15 players come to NRL clubs because the gap between... uh, It's a quicker pipeline to professional rugby league than rugby union. Like, you kind of got to wait your time in rugby union to get a crack. So the that under-17s merit team from 2016 had Stafford Toa, um, had Matthew Tomoko, Philip Makato is with the Warriors, um, Vito Tavang is with the Cronulla Sharks, but it also had Nanai Satoru, it also had Caleb Milne, who are playing first 15 rugby union. So, But then you've also got a situation like the Warriors SG ball team is really interesting because what it allows is it allows under 18 players who are still at high school they can play SG ball for 10 weeks at the start of a year while still being at school. And then after the SG ball season's finished, they can play first 15 rugby. So if you're a Warriors player, you want, you probably want, like, if you've got some really good young players, you might want them at a better school playing better, like, fair enough. Like, if you've got high quality talent, you want that talent playing first 15 rugby because the first 15 rugby is just a tougher competition than first 13 rugby union or club rugby or first 13 rugby league or club club rugby league so if you're the warriors you want your juniors playing the best that they can for their development but you can also offer them sg ball so some of those players Ali Leotawa, um, Jeremiah Asi, they were playing SG ball to start this year, traveling to Australia every second weekend, and then they can also play first 15 rugby. So that's a that's a little nook and cranny. And I also think Cassius Cowley's from Rotorua, the Warriors signed him as part of a connection to, I think there's a club in Rotorua called Pikiao, and then... Cassius Cowley's suddenly playing for Mount Albert Grammar School. So if I connect the dots, the Warriors might have set him up in a school in Auckland, playing first 15 rugby, but also you can play SG ball. There's so many different ways, I think, is the main thing. There's so many different ways to uh, professional rugby league and professional rugby union, but at every level... Uh, in Auckland or uh, in Christchurch, like Wellington, wherever it is, grassroots, they are intertwined. They intersect each other. Rugby union, rugby league, and that's something to keep at the forefront of your mind as you think about rugby league and rugby union in Aotearoa. Yeah, the thing that, um, I mean, that, that does seem like that's a, like that kind of, intertwined nature is pretty beneficial to the players um and it's probably beneficial to um to well certainly beneficial to nrl clubs it's probably beneficial to the wider rugby system as well because it's it really is kind of like the best of both worlds in a way um however it's funny how the the schools themselves just come off as like mercenaries in the middle from that whole situation and uh it does like is it school like especially because a lot of it a lot more of it is on tv now and it's becoming a little bit of an industry and i'm always kind of uncomfortable with how like schoolboy rugby in particular but um 
well, yeah, it's mostly rugby. Rugby's the only one that can get to the point where you can actually talk about it, it as being a little bit of an industry itself. But it it's just always makes me feel a little bit uncomfortable once that kind of thing becomes commercialized because it it starts to drift a bit too close towards um, the American um, university type thing with like the NCAA and whatever, which is um that i mean that's far excessive that's a literally a billion like a billion dollar industry but it's so corrupt and it doesn't benefit the players and it do, and it just goes on to benefit like schools who don't necessarily put the money they should they make off that which they shouldn't really be making at all because it's just this weird kind of um conflict of interest they don't necessarily put that back in the schools the way they should and uh, players are meant to be amateur and it's all sort of corrupt about how that works and um you you can have a car while you're here but and you can have free like um tuition and whatever but we're not actually going to give you much tuition we're going to help you cheat on the tests and whatever and it's just a it's a complete mess and i do see little bits of that kind of capitalistic trends and the way that schoolboy rugby seems to be marketed these days on on tv and stuff and it's just funny how when we talk about this situation of um of like from a player's perspective of how that kind of pathway works and how it seems to sort of benefit both league and union and then you've just got these schools in the middle who who uh don't really care about any of these things they just want to find a way to win what are really meaningless schoolboy rugby games and it's especially at those kind of like the the sort of elite private school type level where you get like um 45 year old white businessmen who turn up on their saturdays for some reason to watch like um grammar or st peter's or whoever play and it's like is this what you do with your weekends like especially because you've got like largely polynesian player bases and a lot of those things and a lot of players who are from outside the area who have been brought in on scholarships and whatever for this reason to win rugby games and then to appease like these old boys who are probably living lifestyles that don't benefit those players as people if, on a political level if you know what i mean i don't want to go down that rabbit hole but it's all just a weird little um a weird little kind of um almost ecosystem which tends to make me feel kind of uncomfortable when i think about it from those school perspectives to be honest yeah it's like you just got to think like you just got to view the schools as being completely selfish entities and if you're a if you're a super duper league head you can just laugh about it because all the schools are providing players to new zealand rugby league like there there's no contractual obligation or duty for these schools yeah. <laughs> to provide players to new zealand rugby union and so yeah and unlike the ncaa which is highly exploitative of its players like this system does work out for the players benefits so they're not being ripped off or anything here no but you just if you're a leaguey you just laugh because you can yeah like yeah all these schools can do what they want they can be on tv and they can do like the schools in auckland i don't care if like the ncaa is just an absolute rot but the if you're like don't get upset about it in new zealand because the worst kept secret in New Zealand is that the schools are providing talent to New Zealand rugby league. And a lot of that talent actually started in rugby league. And it's just a, like, if you're not, if you're not like, if you don't have a vested interest in rugby union, or if you're not like, if that's not all that you want to do and can do NRL salaries, like there, there's going to be changes obviously with the pandemic but as a product why well, those changes are going to impact super rugby as well because we've got no idea what the future is for super rugby but as a product nrl is far bigger globally and obviously it's cross country as well with australia and new zealand the the scope for growth with the nrl is far superior to that of super rugby so I think that carrot is also going to be dangled as we moved out of the the pandemic. Like that's why all those first fifteen players started to go to NRL clubs with no rugby league background, like the guys like Nani Lamape, Conrad Harrell, those type of characters, because it was just a quicker path to professional existence for those players. And that was years ago. And as we get out of this kind of murky waters, it's only going to increase even more. 
And that's why the Kiwi NRL takeover is a thing because it's just going to keep growing, keep growing, and keep growing. Um, yeah, I'm going to... I was thinking about talking about the Warriors here, but I'll, I'm going to do a big deep dive into what's made the Warriors good um, this week. So I'll save a lot of that just with time here. Um, the Warriors did defeat the... Who did they defeat? The Newcastle Knights. Very good win. And you look at someone like Hayes Perham wildcard. Well, first of all, I will say all these young players at the Warriors, like there's a reason why they're able to contribute now, and that is because of the work done from Stephen Kearney and his team over the past five years. These players are contributing to the New Zealand Warriors NRL team now because of the foundations that have been laid. So that's a key idea at the front of my mind. But someone like Hayes Perham, he played, he, like Rotorua Boys High School does a great job because they let their players play first 13 rugby league and rugby union. So Hayes Perham was, um, he was making like New Zealand rugby union rep teams and he was making New Zealand rugby league rep teams as a teenage, as a school kid. So Rotorua Boys High School, I know for sure, do a really good job um, and at just like, they only care... And they've openly said, like, they just want their kids to be the best that they can be in whatever they want to be. They're not, like, all the schools in Auckland, they need to maintain relevancy because their old boys pay for a lot of shit. Like, the, the, it's, all, it's all reputation and what your school's doing first 15-wise is based around um, engaging your old boys who have a lot of money. And that's the basis of first 15 rugby union in Auckland. It's all very, um, very in-house. Whereas Rotorua Boys High School is very uh, much more open-minded. They just want, yeah, you, you want to play rugby league, play rugby league. Like whatever it is you want to do, we have, we're here to support you either way. And the Warriors made a concerted effort of recruiting players from Rotorua Boys High School. Tom Alley is another one. Um, Celestino Ravatumara is another one and then they guys like that Cassius Cowley guy who's much younger they've got that connection to Rotorua um, as well and that's kind of through the good work that has been happening at Rotorua Boys High School Whew. I could go on and on um, but yes I will write about the Warriors and keep an eye on for that one this week what they're doing well they had a good win over the Newcastle Knights and everything's pretty cool with the Warriors I'm enjoying watching the Warriors play rugby league as well so unless you've got something to add to the Warriors there wildcard uh no not really I only watched the very end of that game because I well we had a away game in football so by the time I got back afterwards was sort of like I don't know closer to six o'clock I just looked at the score like the Warriors are winning by a decent margin here against the team I thought was quite good this is strange to me and I didn't watch enough of the game to be able to comprehend it so I'm I got nothing to add to the Warriors chat because I'm genuinely confused about it take us to the flying Kiwis transfer market desk who's gone where who's doing what how are you feeling about it yeah, right. Oh, um, this is something I'm not confused about because I've spent a lot of time over the weekend sort of um, preparing to write about it and uh, studying what's going on and everything. And there's five, like count them up, five major, not all transfers. One of them isn't a transfer yet. It's uh, an impending transfer. But there's like a, a full on top five here that we can talk about. Um, well, count them down number five would be tommy smith to colchester so um while we we're talking about the the return of winston reed last week here we've got a little bit of a return for for tommy smith who hasn't been out of the game nearly as long um he played in america for a while with colorado uh didn't go back the start of this year when shine signed a short-term deal with sunderland didn't play um only had a couple opportunities where he was on the bench and then um the pandemic came along he's now signed with colchester which is pretty interesting because i think it's below like, I know he's been out of the English game playing a different style and whatever, but he's also only 30 years old. Um, he's not got a, a history of injuries to worry about. He's easily good enough to at least be like a, a solid starter in a League One team still, and I think he'd have it on, on the right championship team. I think he could still hold his own there too. Um, 
So League Two is definitely a drop down from what he's capable of. He did have interest from... Um, I, I know they talked about Hearts, who have been relegated in um, in uh, Scotland, so they'd have been playing in championship there. Um, and the late uh, interest came through from one of them um, Indian clubs, so you could have had a situation there if he'd signed with one of them. He could have been marking Roy Krishna a couple times a season, which would have been something to watch. Uh, but Colchester, a team he's been on trial with for a couple weeks now, played a few friendly games. There's big praise from him, from the uh, manager there, so it's clear he'd not only be um, a decent player for them, but like straight-up regular and a key player and an important one for them. And yes, it's slightly below where he could be playing, but this is a team who only just missed out on the playoffs last season. They're hoping to have strengthened significantly, so they are a team that's planning very much on getting promoted so it's a uh it's one of them up, upwardly mobile type situations for tommy smith and in the very least we should see him playing a lot of football and hopefully that's going to be the case too with uh number four which would be michaela moore signing with liverpool um with this one it's kind of the same thing because liverpool just got relegated you think like uh you think like you know liverpool one of the two or three most famous clubs on the planet at the moment um, and also historically, like the all time in terms of prestige. But while their men's team just busted a long ass drought and look amazing, and although they did just lose the Community Shield, um, but you know, defending Premier League champions and all that, won the European Cup two seasons ago. Their women's team's been relegated, and it's not a great look for that as a, for them as a club. Um, which also kind of means it's not a bad time for someone like Michaela Moore to be signing. Because I think, similar with Tommy Smith, I think she's good enough to be playing WSL in the top flight in England. But this way, she gets a season with Liverpool to sort of be a key player as they get promoted, to sort of entrench herself in the club, win over the fans, and um, have that have that foundation for when they presumably go straight back up. Because I think they're, they're going to be too strong for the championship. We saw this with... Um, Manchester United's women's team a couple years ago where they didn't previously have one so they built they had to start on the championship and then they cruised to a um, you know they cruised to promotion Spurs did the same that same year as well and both those teams held their own really well last season in the top flight for their first season up so I think Liverpool if they get the investments then they're gonna be pretty strong and they're gonna probably go back up um, so, you know, it's a it's a long-term vision from Michaela Moore, who's coming off playing in relegation battles in Germany the last couple of years, successful relegation battles in which she was an important player. But yeah, def definitely a different kind of challenge and hopefully a lot of wins, a lot of clean sheets and bouncing up into the, into the top flight next season where she can continue to excel, which is basically what she's done at every step of the ladder throughout her career so far. Um, slight note on that is that one of the assistant coaches for the Liverpool women's team is Emma Humphreys, who's a former New Zealand international, you know, um, with ex-football ferns. So a bit of a Kiwi connection there as well, which probably helped that get, you know, help get that one over the line. Uh, number three, where will I go with this? I reckon number three would be Rebecca Stott, who is not signed anywhere, but on Friday night, as a couple of these other stories were breaking, around the same time as Michaela Moore's um, transfer was announced, Melbourne City puts up a little like farewell message to Rebecca Stotts. Um, she's played, um, I think, tied most times for Melbourne City since the, she was there of their first season. Um, she's played more W League games than any other New Zealander, and it's not even close. Like I think she's got double more than anyone else. Um, so just, uh, yeah, and also studies coming off probably her best ever season. And it's a, um, it's a little bit of a weird time for the W League because they're looking at, hopefully they're looking at expansion as well. I, we're hoping to get a Phoenix team in there, um, next season, if not then the season afterwards, we'll see how that goes, especially because the old pandemic probably hasn't helped matters in, in that regard, but um, Rebecca Stott coming off her finest season for Melbourne City at a time when a lot of the top players in the W League are leaving, and particularly Australian internationals, but not not exclusively Australian internationals, and a lot of them are going. Well, they're basically all going to Europe, and a lot of them are going to English top flight um, WSL clubs, and that sort of left Rebecca Stott in an interesting place because she's as good as some of those Aussie internationals who are getting these contracts. So she's every bit like um, worthy of a similar kind of transfer 
It's just a matter of whether she would want to, because the Australian League is quite convenient in that it times up with a couple other ones. So you get a lot of players from America coming and playing in Australia in their off season from America. Um, Rebecca Stott's done that twice, where she's played. Uh, she played a season with Seattle. She played a season with uh, Sky Blue in NWSL in between W League seasons. And then also last year, she went and played in Norway. Uh, this year, she didn't have anything lined up. But the fact that Melbourne City have actually done like a farewell thing suggests that this isn't just one of those. Like she's not just going to go to um, Scandinavia and be back for the next W League season. This suggests she won't be back for the next W League th um, season, which in turn suggests that she's going to one of them bigger leagues that clashes with it, which I think it, I mean, all signs point to the WSL. Um, we currently have Rhea Percival at Spurs and Aaron Naylor at Reading. I don't know where, I, I don't know where Stott would go, but I will say the player that she is tied for in terms of most appearances for Melbourne City is um, Australian international Steph Catley, who's one of Stott's best friends, and she's just signed with Arsenal. So, um, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. Even by the time this podcast comes out, that that move might have been confirmed at the moment. We just know that she's leaving Melbourne City and probably signing in Europe, most likely England. But it's a, it's a wait and see on that regard. Um, I'll chuck in number two. I reckon this is probably Libby Kakache finally getting that deal done with uh, St. Truiden, which we knew was coming. It was a bit of a badly kept secret. Um, Belgian top flight, coached by Kevin Musket. Also, uh, Luciano Trani is on the... Um, coaching staff there is a former Phoenix assistant, so somewhat like there's I think I think there's probably a feeling with Kakache where he's been so good for the Wellington Phoenix and so visibly good as well because this is, you know, a team playing out of New Zealand. We we know exact it's not like the kind of thing transfer which will sneak up under the radar. We knew this was coming. Um we know how good he can be and therefore we know like what he's worth, but at the same time, like could he have gone to a a slightly more competitive league than Belgium? Belgium's pretty good, but it's not, you know, England or France or Germany or Spain or Italy. Um, could he have gone to one of those more prestigious leagues? Possibly. Like, he probably would have had... There was a Paul Eiffel reckons he's had um, English championship clubs contacting him about Kakache, so it seemed like the opportunity was out there. Um, but if he were to do that, would he get the same, like... Uh, guarantee of minutes that he would get at St. Troyden? Probably not. Would he have the same kind of like um, cushion for landing in, like for um, coming down and with uh, having a, a manager who is familiar with him from playing in the same league, uh, assistant manager who's, I don't think, I don't think he uh, swapped, uh, I don't think he cl uh, like crossed over with Kakache as a player, but um, everyone sort of knows the Kakaches anyway because his dad runs a restaurant in Wellington and the Phoenix going back a few years, have been, you know, would have team meetings there and stuff like that. So um, there's definitely some familiarity there as well. And I think that, I think the, it's a patient move from Kakache. It's definitely a stepping stone. Like he's not, this isn't where he would want to end up in Europe. I don't think he expends to spend the next 15 years playing for St. Troyden. But, you know, you go in there, you, you impress a few people just as he did at the Phoenix. You have a couple good years. Um get them scouting vids coming out about you, get a few, like maybe up your agency kind of interest and stuff like that, and you see where you go. It's a it's a stepping stone, and I think a lot of Kiwi footballers fail, even ones who are easily good enough to, to have long careers in Europe, fail because they don't land in the right situation. It's really tricky to to um, predict what that's kind of, like what is the beneficial situation, where am I going to get guarantee minutes where you might sign with a club where you think you will and the manager gets sacked next guy comes in you're on your ass um sitting training with the reserves because for whatever reason he just doesn't rate you or um Stefan Marinovic had that situation in Vancouver where he'd done pretty well as a goalkeeper until they sacked their manager and then the next manager comes in decides regardless of how good he thought Marinovic was he just didn't want to use an import spot on a goalkeeper he wanted to um he thought American goalkeepers were of a higher standard compared to American outfielders so he'd rather bring in an import outfielder which by the way is completely true like the standard of American goalkeeping is much higher than the standard of American uh not goalkeeping I'm uh, just based on like I watch a 
I, I watch a, I watch a decent amount of MLS, but I follow a lot more of it just through Flying Kiwis in particular, and that's definitely a trend I can see. Like American goalkeepers are pretty decent, um, probably a skill set that transfers to other sports that that, that are popular in America as well. Um, to be honest. New Zealand actually has had similar things where we've produced more quality goalkeepers in the past than we do uh, outfielders, but this does seem to be changing at the moment. Um, so yeah, solid from Kakache. I don't think it's um, the sort of like anywhere near the the glamour of Sapri Singh to buy Munich, but it's a it's a smart, assured move from a player who is going to go many places in his career. Then the other one, uh, number one, I'll chuck out is. Um, Nando Pineker to Rio Ave in, in Portugal, which com came completely out of the blue. Didn't expect this. Um, Pineker had been playing for Grasshoppers in Switzerland alongside Max Matter, who was also there. Uh, Max Matter, as far as I know, is still there. But Pineker actually, like both those two, di both those two guys started in the um, in the sort of youth team for Grasshoppers, worked their way up into post pandemic. They both got promoted to the to the first team. Matter didn't go anywhere further than that um didn't make any match day squads Pineke did make a couple and he actually um played two games we came on as a sub one game started another game so um just showing the progression from from him even in that short amount of time uh but the by grasshoppers uh who are a fairly big club in switzerland but have fallen on tough times they were relegated the season before that um, they failed to get promoted again. They thought they would bounce straight back up, couldn't close out the season, uh, just sort of failed down the stretch a little bit there and, and missed out on that one. So another season was beckoning on the second tier in Switzerland and maybe Pineke could have been getting more regular minutes there. But then all of a sudden in comes this interest from Rio Ave, who finished fifth in Portugal last season, uh, which is good enough to get them into Europa League qualifying um, a strong club, also the club uh, that has a, a little bit of a, of a Kiwi connection as well because uh, Ollie White spent a season within their under-19s team, so did David Yu. Um, David Yu is still over in, in Portugal playing lower leagues um, and Ollie White most recently playing for Team Wellington, um, currently playing... Uh, I actually don't know what club he's at in the winter season, but... Um, you know, currently playing back in New Zealand. So, uh, for, yeah, was, yeah, that kind of interest from a top flight club in Portugal, which is also where Tyler Boyd made a name for himself as, too. So there's a, as another bit of a Kiwi connection there too, uh, in terms of just like Portuguese interests. So I, I think it's a little bit of a no brainer, especially when they offer you a four year contract. So you go and sign that one straight away. And, they did, and it was a little bit of a surprise even for Rio Ave fans because he was sort of brought out as a as a bit of a um, like they didn't there wasn't really rumors about him. He's not a big enough name for to be in the all like, like the gossip columns and whatever. So all of a sudden he comes through and their team uh, well it was like a club it was like a club day, you know, like a, a, the opening of the season kind of thing. And they go through all their squads and then they get to the point where it's like, and by the way, we've got two secret signings here to announce. And he was one of them. The other was um, Ivo Pinto, who uh, for, a fullback who once played for Norwich in the Premier League. So yeah, de decent old, um, decent old surprise that one. I think it didn't see that one coming at all. Nando Pineker, but I think it's a, it's a good signing for him in, in the kind of league where I think he'd he'd fit quite nicely. I don't know if you go straight into playing decent regular minutes, whether you go straight into match day squads, but a four year contract suggests that he's got plenty of time to to figure things out. So bloody absolutely, like all these, all five of these moves happened within the last sort of four or five days. I mean, four of them all happened on the weekend. Tommy Smith was a couple of days earlier, but absolutely hectic times in the flying Kiwis transfers and. Yeah, man. Uh, I guess this was also part of the fact that a lot of these seasons, um, the off seasons, have been condensed because the one season finishes and a couple of weeks we're straight into the next one. So everything's happening all at once. And last week we were talking about a whole lot of goals. This week we're talking about a whole lot of transfers. It's man, it's uh, it's, it's exciting times uh, in a few different ways. Exciting times indeed, and we're just here to document it and make sure people know about it. Because holy shit. Kiwi sport is popping. Bit of Kiwi music going down well as well. Well, well, well. We'll wrap it up there, Wildcat. All is well. Another podcast, Undusted. There'll be an email. It would have been delivered by the time you're listening to it. So if you like our shit, sign up to that. Just to mainly keep 
up to date with what the Kiwis are doing around the world in a hard and fast format and uh, any other juicy bits and bobs. Otherwise, on my hoist at the moment, got a do a full rundown of the White Ferns squad, update the CPL, write about the Warriors, we'll do a encyclopedia, Kiwi and our own encyclopedia as well. What's on your hoist this weekend? This week, sorry, wildcard over the next few days. What are you writing about? Well, immediate priority would be flying Kiwis, and then after that, we've, we'll have a bit of a uh, should be. Oh, well, I'm ex- I don't want to jinx things, but I'm expecting the um, OKC Thunder will probably not win both of their remaining two games um, against the Houston Rockets, which means there'll be a Stephen Adams uh, roundup. Well, either way, there'll be a Stephen Adams roundup at the end of that series, whether it's um, whether it's them progressing or not as. Uh, there will be some Stephen Adams stuff. Once that's done, I suppose I've got to get to work on the next quotable Stephen Adams for for this season too. But that'll be down the line a little bit further. Um, Wellington Phoenix postseason primer, um, however that works, off season, whatever. Uh, looking at who's under contract, where, what areas they're looking for. Just generally turning the the radar towards next season. That'll be on the way as well. And hey, uh, it's almost time for one of my um, annual favorites, which is uh, ahead of the NFL season. I'll write my um, quarterback preseason quarterback rankings, which I've done every year for about five or six years, and hopefully enough people will read it that I get to keep doing it each year. It's um, it's the one sort of like real, uh, I, wouldn't, I don't know if I'd say passion project, but I don't know. It's one of those ones that I write kind of for myself rather than for the audience, but um, I've been writing NFL stuff since the start, and I've fallen away from writing more Premier League things because I've tried to focus on Kiwi football angles that aren't otherwise covered elsewhere. But the NFL stuff, I, I, I have sentimental um, connections to it, so I keep on with that. Um, and that that season, I don't know what it's going to look like. I think it it's a very high percent, like high percentage chance that the NFL season could be an absolute mess because of because of all the pandemic stuff that's going on, not to mention political stuff that's going on. But one way or another, I'll have some words on it, and it'll start with the um, with the annual quarterback rankings. And I can tell you he'll be number one straight off the bat as well, no matter we Patrick Mahomes. Boom shakalaka. Your bum smells like kaka. Give us a smell. <laughs> Bloody hell. Until next time on the Niche Cast. Have a good one. Cha-cha.